Hi! So this is going to be my second video in this sort of series where I talk about the movies that I've been watching this month for my 30 days, 30 films sort of movie challenge that I'm doing. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I will link in the description the sort of introduction announcement video um, and part one where I talk about the first three films that I watched in the month. Um, yeah, those will be in the description as well as the card. And also I'm hoping that this lighting is okay for some reason. My last video, the first video of this sort of series, I guess, uh, it looked like yellower and it was really bothering me. Uh, cause it looked fine on my computer, but then when I was looking at my notifications on my phone, the video looked like yellow. It had like a yellow tint and I was like, I really don't like that. Uh, so hopefully this one doesn't look like that, but it doesn't really matter, I guess. Oh man, I forgot to get one of the movies that I actually have. Okay, I gotta go get that. Okay, I just put a light here, but it's not like facing me. So maybe the lighting changed a little bit because maybe it, it's like, here, want to see it? It's this. <laughs> <laughs> it's very white though, so maybe it'll like balance out any yellow tones. Okay, moving on. Uh, these three movies are all available on the Criterion channel, by the way. Uh, one of them I own, but I the other two I watched on the Criterion channel. Uh, so if you would like to watch them, I think it's the only place that you could. So the fourth movie that I watched this month and for this sort of movie challenge was Sylvie et le Fantôme, uh, which is Sylvia and the Ghost, uh, if you want like the English translation of that. It's from 1946 and I forgot to write down the director's name, but I usually have like information in the description of the films that I mention and also I have like some note notebook pieces of papers here. So uh, or, well, notepad pieces of paper here that I was writing stuff down as I was watching the movies. So this movie is about Sylvie who lives in this sort of like castle with her family and uh, it's rumored that the castle is haunted by this ghost, Alain, but I don't remember his last name so we're just going to call him Alain. And Sylvie is really fascinated by Alain and this story of how he died and she believes that his ghost is is roaming the castle and is is at least possesses the the portrait that is in one of the rooms of the castle. And the movie takes place around Sylvie's birthday and her father sells the portrait but sort of in order to make it up to her uh she, he feels really bad because she's so she's she's so adoring of this portrait and uh has a sort of attachment to it, uh, he decides to hire an actor to play this ghost of Ellen and show up at her birthday party. <laughs> but along the way, there's also a couple other guys who end up being involved in the story. One guy is like a burglar and shows up around the same time that the actor who is supposedly playing the ghost uh, arrives. So you have the actor the real actor and you have this burglar and then you have this other guy who is just like on the premises. He was part of the group of people who purchased the portrait from the father and he met Syl Sylvie um, briefly and is infatuated by her. Uh, there's a lot of sort of like insta love in this. Like the two guys, uh, the burglar guy and the trespasser guy. <laughs> Uh, I guess they're both trespassing though, but they both like fall for Sylvie really quickly and I'm like, you're fighting over a girl you don't even know anything about and she doesn't even know you either. <laughs> so let's chill out when you say that you love her. So that's mostly what happens in the film and that's that's what the film is about. Obviously, I'm not going into all the details um, and I really liked it. Uh, oh, damn it. <laughs> I forgot to mention that if you wanted to, like, keep up with what I've been watching, uh, you can also follow me on my Instagram. I've been posting uh, a photo uh, from each film as I've been watching them. I'm, I, I'm usually, I usually post, like, the day after I watched that movie, if that makes sense. And then uh, also my Letterboxd. I obviously put, at least rate the films and add them to, like, my diary, so... Uh, my Instagram and my letterbox will be in the description also. Um, so I really liked this film. I found it really engaging. I, I like, 
I don't even think I really looked away except for when my dog was being really cute and I looked at my dog because not only is Alain a ghost, uh, but his dog is as well. And there's um, a ghost that the fam- oh, there's a ghost, there's a dog that the family has and he can see the ghost. So he barks at the ghosts all the time. And my dog was intrigued by that. Not only uh, did it make my dog like look at the screen even more, but like my, my dog will watch movies with me. Like he's, he gets distracted by the movement on the screen and he'll watch movies. And I, I'm very curious to know how much he actually like, how, how it's being processed and, and what he can comprehend when he's looking at a television screen. But he tried to like jump on my screen because of the dogs in the movie. I found that the, the, I think the introduction of the film is really well done. It's Sylvie telling other children, I think they're her cousins, but really I don't know the relationship between them. Um, but she's telling this group of kids the story of Ellen and how he died and sort of his life before, before he died. And, you know, they're at his home. He's, he's the original owner and his portrait is up on the wall and it's kind of a famous portrait. And so you as like the, an audience member, as a viewer of the film are also like, I feel, I felt pulled in because she was telling the story and I was like, I want to know what happened to Ellen. I want to, how did he die? Here's his portrait, things like that. Um, so I felt immediately drawn to the film and I just, yeah, I was just, just engaged with it the whole time. Uh, so Ellen is actually played by Jacques Tati who I have not seen any of his films, but this is his first on-screen role, and he so he plays the ghost of Alain, and I like the way that they did that. I think it's double exposure, but I could be wrong on, like, that being the technique on how they make it look like he's there, but, like, still transparent in a way. So, um, I, I liked the way that he looked, and the dog as well, his ghost dog. I don't know what his dog's name is. I forgot, which is weird because Sylvie named her dog after his dog. <laughs> so there are two dogs with the same name. And uh, yeah, so I liked the way that that was done. And also just certain certain scenes that had a charm to it. There is a scene though when Ellen takes a ring off his finger and puts it on Sylvie's. And like, the, so the, the ring is like, a ghost ring <laughs> and uh the way that her hand is like placed on the piano when she takes off her hand when she takes her hand off the piano the ring like slides off and I just thought like that was cleverly done and other, other things like that that have to do with him being a ghost and and there are other sort of s phantom objects and then the real like physical objects as well so I think that's all I have to say about Sylvie et le fantôme. Uh, so moving on to the fifth movie that I watched this month, uh, Two Tons of Turquoise to Taos Tonight from 1975. And this was directed by uh, Robert Downey Sr. I don't have a lot to say on this. Uh, it's like 50 something minutes and I ended up being like really early on, I ended up being like a day behind. And because I ended up, I think it was the third man, I didn't end up finishing the night of. I ended up finishing it actually the morning after. Um, so anyway, yeah, I ended up being like a day behind and so I chose a shorter film. So t what Two Tons of Turquoise to Taos Tonight doesn't really have a plot. It's an experimental film, which I didn't really know beforehand. Uh, but seeing it from the perspective now, like, understanding that it's an experimental film and just a bunch of clips basically put together in this one film, I I appreciate it more and, like, respect that. I just didn't like it that much. And complete opposite situation of Sylvie et le Fantôme. It's, like, this one just did not, I was not engaged with this at all. Um, and so I'm just going to read the the notes that I made while I was watching it in order, obviously. I literally don't even know what this is, but it's not even an hour long, so here I go, I guess. That's how I started. I'm questioning this decision. What is this? Is she trying to over-exaggerate? Am I paying attention? Is this cohesive? This guy mentioned gargoyles, and now I'm thinking of slash reminded of Riverdale. Kind of a waste of time, but I also wasn't paying that much attention, honestly. <laughs> That's what I wrote. Um, and just to, like, clarify that whole, like, 
Gargoyle Riverdale thing. So I've seen like if Riverdale's a show on the CW that is sort of notorious for being a terrible, terrible show. It's just not good. The writers, I think, are just like trying. I don't know what they're trying to do. They're 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 using like a random word generator and just being like, "Yup, this word has to be included in our script this this episode." I don't know, but I've seen people a lot of videos of just like making fun of Riverdale, and uh, specifically ones that are like the downfall and just like how terrible the writing is on Riverdale. And the videos mention like a gargoyle king. I don't know what the heck the gargoyle king is. It doesn't make sense when I think about Riverdale. I did watch the first like four episodes, I think. I don't know, a handful of episodes when the show first started, but I wasn't really interested. Like it's a, it's a really easy show, I think, to binge, but that's it. Like there's no like substance to it. Um, and I, I don't know what's happened. I mean, I kind of know things that have happened because of like videos that I've watched on YouTube and other things that I've seen just on social media surrounding it, but it's gotten in, it's gone in a completely different direction from like what I thought Riverdale was supposed to be about. So there's mention of this Gargoyle King. I don't know what it is. Do the writers even know? Do the actors even know? I don't know. But there's a Gargoyle King, apparently, in Riverdale. And now whenever I hear the word Gargoyle, I think of Riverdale. And somebody in this movie, two tons of turquoise to Taos tonight, mentioned a Gargoyle. I don't even understand why he was mentioning a Gargoyle in the first place. But there we go. <laughs> Half of that wasn't even about this movie. It was about Riverdale. But I felt like if you didn't know what Riverdale was, I felt like I had to clarify that's, I guess, it with Two Tons of Turquoise to Taos Tonight from 1975, an experimental film by Robert Downey Sr. Um, also, I might be saying things that, um, like, I might not say something that I put in, like, my Instagram post is what I'm saying, so feel free to look at the descriptions of, of those, the captions of, of my posts. Mm -hmm. And then, the sixth film that I watched this month was Picnic at Hanging Rock from 1975, directed by Peter Weir, and this was a rewatch for me. I watched it again because of Dice K's film club live stream thing that he has going on, um, and so that was, that was the second one. Picnic at Hanging Rock is the second one. I have this, so I can actually hold it up. Uh, this is the, I don't know if they still do the dual format edition, but this is the dual format edition, and it also comes with the book, which I have read only the first time that, only before the first time I watched the movie. So it's been a few years, and I've never reread the book, is what I'm saying. Uh, but I've seen the film plenty of times. Uh, it's it's one of my favorite films, and so I I have a lot to say on it, but I'm probably not going to be able to say it all here and now, as well as um, I've sort of been inspired and want to get back into, well, not that I was ever, like, really into writing. I've just, I'm complimented on my writing a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I just sort of wanted to see what it was like to write about a film while I was watching it. And so I, I felt like this was a good time to do that because I was re-watching the film and also I just have so many thoughts on it. And it's a film that I get I get more out of the more times I watch it. Every time I, I sort of end up focusing on something else or noticing something else. And this time around too, I like forgot a bunch of things that are part of the plot. And like, uh, well, okay, before I get into more like details of what happens, um, if you haven't seen the film yet, I'll just give you a brief synopsis and then go into more details. Um, but I mean, I love this film, so I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. It's about this group of girls who go to a boarding school in Australia and they are going, uh, it's Valentine's Day and they're going to go have a picnic at Hanging Rock. And uh, while they are there, three of the students and one of the teachers go missing. And it's about the effects that this has uh, overall, just like on the townspeople, on the school, on the staff of the school, on the other students, on the other girls that that they went to school with. And I think that that's the best way to put it. Like, it's about the effects, um, especially because it has 
And this may be information you don't want to know if you haven't seen it. It depends on what kind of person you are. Um, but the ending, there is a lack of a resolution. You don't really know what happened to the girls who are missing or the people who are missing because the teacher is also missing. But some things that I had forgotten um, between rewatching, between rewatches of this film and just, I guess, Focusing, sometimes I, I think maybe because I focus on certain things when I'm watching the film, uh, that ends up being what I remember the most when I think back on it. For example, um, I became really interested in Irma's character, uh, I think the second time I watched it. And since then, a lot of the times actually, oh my god, I feel like I'm all over the place, but a lot of the times actually, if... I don't necessarily have a character who is my favorite or who I'm particularly drawn to. The person who suddenly I become like interested in, that character ends up being my favorite. And so Irma is actually my favorite character in this. Um, that was my explanation, I guess, that that I was just like drawn to her at one point and I became like more interested in her compared to the other characters when I was rewatching it uh, a while back, like years ago. Um, so now, like, when I think of the film, Irma's one of the first things that I think of. And so this time around, what I've been trying to say is that uh, I had forgotten certain plot lines, like Mrs. Appleyard kills or maybe doesn't kill Sarah. Like, that's still kind of iffy. I realized that it's not... It's more implied that she killed Sarah. But really, it could have been Sarah that just, like, committed suicide. So then it's like... Well, which is it? And again, you don't you don't have a solution to that. Um, and then also, I totally forgot about Sarah and who we know as oh well, it's Albert and then Bertie. Bertie's his like nickname. They're they're brother and sister. They they were both orphans. And again, it's it's I mean that one's a lot easier to like put the pieces together. But again, it's never like explicitly really said. It's just Albert had a sister named Sarah, and Sarah happens to have had somebody in her life named Bertie. I don't think that it's, I don't think it's said that, like, Bertie is her brother, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, yeah, okay. And then also, like, Bertie has that, like, well, Albert has that, like, sort of vision, that dream of Sarah, of Sarah, like, dying, and I had completely forgotten about, about that as well. Um, and you know what I didn't do? I forgot, I didn't, um, I didn't fully explain my whole writing thing. Um, I decided to write about this book, or about this movie, because I, w I just want to, want to. <laughs> but I want, I want to talk more about it and discuss it more and just sort of, just sort of share my thoughts more, um, through like a sort of video essay on the film. And so that's, that's the main reason why, well, I, I wanted to write it for myself as well, but another main reason is because I would like to make a video s solely on Picnic at Hanging Rock. I should have, like, outlined this or something. I feel like, I really feel I'm, this is the way normal people will speak about something, and I go like this. I end up in the same place, usually, but th that's the way I talk compared to people just going in a straight line. I just go on a bunch of tangents. Somehow they're all interconnected. You have to put it together. Oh, man. I should have said this, like, the first thing. <laughs> this should have been the first thing I said, but I was just looking at, like, the notes that I sort of took, and one of the things that I love about this movie is that I'm immediately drawn into it, and... There are so many aspects of it that I love that the movie, I feel like, is a sort of metaphor for Hanging Rock or, like, the other way around. Like, like the movie is Hanging Rock to me, like, as a viewer. <laughs> uh, you know, the girls, the girls explore and, and they keep going deeper and higher into and on Hanging Rock and... That's the way that, like, I feel they're just, like, lured into it and drawn to it. And, like, that's the way I feel about the movie. 
um, and I'm forgetting like the exact sentence I wrote, but it's something like, it's something of, it's something to that point where I feel like I have to venture in the movies everything because that's the way the girls are like with Hanging Rock. During this rewatch of the film, I was more interested in the characters' relationships. In previous, previous times, I've thought about each of the characters' like psyches and just the way that they're feeling and the way that they're reflecting on what's happening and the sort of interaction that they're having with other characters only based on this event that has occurred. But there are certain times when I started to wonder about what the characters' relationships were like before the movie really takes place. Uh, specifically, like, Irma and Sarah. Irma at one point when uh, it's it's Miranda and Irma and Marion, whose name I actually had to look up because uh, I had forgotten it, uh, and Edith. They are the ones, they're the four students who are wandering around Hanging Rock um, and not specifically at like the sort of picnic site. And uh, at one point Irma says that Sarah reminds her of this deer that her father once brought home and she tried to take care of but it ended up dying. And it just made me wonder like what Sarah's relationship is like with Irma. Like what are they friends? Are they, do they not really know each other a lot? Clearly you can tell that Sarah is closest to Miranda, which is like another thing that I would sort of like to know. I, I'm curious on what Sarah's feelings towards Miranda really are. And that's something that uh, someone had mentioned in during like the live stream uh, about sort of overlooking any sort of lesbian themes that are in the book. Um, and I, because I, I go on Tumblr, did I already say this? I don't think so, but I go on Tumblr to find like stills and just screenshots of the film uh, to post like on my Instagram when I say, hey, this is the next film that I watched. Um, I use Tumblr a lot to find photos from movies and I had forgotten that Amazon had made a mini-series of Picnic at Hanging Rock. Whether you want to consider it, I mean, technically it's both a remake of the film, but also another adaptation of the book, um, whatever you want to call it. But Picnic at Hanging Rock, there's now an Amazon series uh, available to watch. It came out last year, and I saw a lot of images from that, and I was trying not to look too much because it is something I am interested in watching. Uh, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But now that I've rewatched Picnic at Hanging Rock, the film, even more so, I I'm like, I, I want to get to this soon watching the, the miniseries. And I noticed a lot of, it seems like they're going to explore the characters' relationships a lot more, specifically probably between the, the main, like, five girls, I would say. Uh, the, the four girls that I already mentioned that, the four girls that are the ones to explore Hanging Rock, Miranda, Marion, Irma, and Edith, and then also Sarah, who doesn't end up going on the picnic. So it looks like the miniseries is going to explore their relationships more between the characters, and I saw some gifs, 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 whatever you want to call them, of, like, characters kissing. So I'm wondering how, how far it goes into, I guess, lesbian themes, just to stick with what I said before. And then also... It, during that same scene where Irma is talking about, uh, is comparing Sarah to this deer that she tried to take care of, but then it ended up dying, uh, she has a conversation with Edith. And then I was like, well, what's Irma's relationship like with Edith? Because Edith just seems to be the one that no one really likes all that much, and she's just sort of like a follower. But that conversation that they had, just it seemed to be more sincere than like the way that I had thought about Edith with the, in relation to the other girls, I guess. Um, and she's probably been able to persuade the other girls who went about what happened because she's the only one that, like, returned the day that the picnic was happening. Of course, Irma ends up being found later on and they sort of take it out on her. And yeah, I still think that that scene, um, where, they just, like, blame her. They just, like, attack her and take it out 
on her. That's such a fascinating scene to me. Uh, and that that's really one of... I mean, that's a scene that sticks out in my mind because it's something that I was like, what are, what are they thinking? What is, what's happening here? I just wanted to like analyze it. The last thing that I think I have time to mention here is that I focused a lot more on Mrs. Appleyard, who I had just kind of shrugged off before. Uh, like she's fine, whatever, but I was so much more interested in the girls. And I don't know if that, I feel like maybe because I'm younger and especially if I'm younger when I first watch a film, I'm just more interested in the characters who are around my age. Uh, but Mrs. Appleyard, uh, I just, I don't know. I just, I think I'm still sort of figuring out my thoughts on her. Uh, she just becomes so disheveled. And again, I mentioned in the, during the live stream live chat thing that her scenes are so much darker and oh man I just have so much I want to say <laughs> um I only have like a couple more minutes that I can be filming though um yeah her scenes are like so much darker she wears darker clothes compared to the girls and it just it creates this contrast but then also it's like oh, who was it oh, I was talking to somebody in the live stream and he had mentioned the word tainted and I was like that's a really good way of describing it because it feels like like as as the movie progresses it gets darker there's a lot more scenes at night and and it seems like they are closing the curtains a lot more and just not letting as much light in and yeah it just seems a lot darker and I guess it's sort of like Hanging Rock and what happened, the event. Everything is just tainting the film overall, even even visually. So um, that's something that I'm going to have to remember to write. Did I write that in my document? I'm going to have to look. Um, and Mrs. Appleyard, did she kill Sarah? Did she not? Like, what does she have against Sarah? Uh, I don't know. Mrs. Appleyard... <laughs> One of the things that is an implication of her actually killing Sarah is that she, when they find Sarah's body, uh, she's wearing black as if she's dressed for a funeral. And it's like, well, is she mourning Sarah? But then also she could be like mourning like her school because there's no way it's going to be able, she's going to be able to run it. And also maybe she's mourning herself. Like, did she go out? Like, again, now there's mystery also surrounding her death. Did she go out? To, ha to Hanging Rock to kill herself? Was she drawn there? Did just something happen while she was there? I don't know. I'm gonna run out of time. I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of these films in relation to what I said or just in general. Um, thank you for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!